Welcome everyone to the Tulsa.net users group. Tonight, Jay Harris talking on chasing squirrels, keeping up with new technologies. Jay, we've been friends for quite a, uh, several years now. I really appreciate you doing this for us. And I'll let you go ahead and do the uh, introduction and take it from here. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be spending some time talking about new technologies, talking about what we do with them, talk about how we manage them, how we consume them, how we pursue them. Um, new software languages, new libraries, new platforms, they're released at, at an exhausting pace. Uh, many, perhaps, perhaps even most, are just distractions that we'll never even grasp, um, like uh, developer puppies chasing technology squirrels. So how do we know which ones to pursue? How do we know which ones that will be beneficial to us? How do we know which ones are going to be a valuable investment? How do we know which ones will live and which ones will die? Where should where should we spend our time? Certainly we don't we don't want to waste our time. Um, hello, I'm Jay Harris, um, software developer uh, based out of Las Vegas. Uh, I am founder and principal consultant for Arana Software. Uh, we provide um, web consulting, custom application uh, development, and we too face these same issues every day. Of course we do. Which libraries and frameworks should we pursue? Which ones do we want to invest in? Um, which ones have a growing and mature community? Um, which ones can we support? Which ones do we want to support and continue to support? Where should we put our time? Where should we put our dollars? Not only do I not want to waste my time, I certainly don't want to waste my dollars. There's so much that goes into building modern web applications and mobile applications, software development in general. Um, setting aside those core languages, .NET and Ruby and Java and PHP and Python and JavaScript. There are so many components that go into building a modern app. So many tools, so many frameworks, so many libraries, uh, things that we bolt onto our apps, things that control the look, things that control the structure, um, things that control the code. There's this endless fire hose of libraries and technologies and tooling uh, even tooling that helps us manage our tooling. It never ends. It just keeps going and going and going. And as you're watching these go by, I'm sure there are some that you have familiarity with and some that you've heard about and some that you probably haven't. And the person that's next to you in the box of other video screens on my screen probably has a different set that they're viewing, um, that they're familiar with, that they're exposed to, that they've never even heard of before in their lives. So many. And it influences all of our actions and questions. Like, am I coding this the right way? Am I building this the right way? Questions like, uh, that make me think about tomorrow and how I'm going to build applications tomorrow. And certainly, Questions that make me think about yesterday. <laughs> All these years later, that last one still hurts. Yesterday still hurts. Yesterday is hard. In our normal lives, we have fears and regrets. And our professional lives are certainly no different. Um, the technology choices we made yesterday, they didn't always work out, right? And it's framed, it's influenced, it's tainted our approach to technology decisions for tomorrow. Um, back in 2007, uh, Silverlight was, was released as the next flash killer. Uh, it was better, it was stronger, it was simpler, it was stabler, it was much more secure. Um, it focused on uh, building rich media applications, um, unseating the other tools and the other competitors like uh, Java applets and Shockwave and Flash. And though Silverlight was uh, phenomenal at, at uh, rich interactive multimedia applications, uh, its its greatest strength was streaming video. And it quickly 
became the king at doing so. Uh, back then in 2007, video was the big new thing. Um, there were new entries to the video market every month. From late 2006 through late 2007, the internet saw the foundation of Twitch, the foundation of Crunchyroll, the foundation of Amazon Video, of Pornhub, of Vivo, of Hulu, and the digital, video, the digital streaming um, division of Netflix, which of course, for us old timers, remember it back when it was still DVDs by mail. Yes, the internet came to us in the in our mailboxes uh, every week. Um, and most of these, most of these were powered by Silverlight. Uh, in 2008, uh, the Summer Games, uh, the Summer Olympic Games in Beijing were streamed uh, to the world by Silverlight. In 2010, the Winter Olympics in Vancouver were streamed to the world by Silverlight. By 2012, uh, Movies on demand through Amazon, through Netflix, were streamed to the world by Silverlight, and by 2013, it was dead. It was that fast. Silverlight may have seemed like a solid investment, a wonderful investment in 2007, but in a few years, it had entirely disappeared. Um, people, people were mad. People were upset. Uh, they invested their time into this, this technology, and Microsoft had just walked away from it. And it happens. For all of these technologies, it happens. It happens all the time. But we're still afraid of it. It happens all the time, but we're still afraid of it. And as we pursue this fire hose of new technologies, being afraid is really what drives our hearts and our minds. Our choices, our, our pursuits are driven by fear. Fear of abandonment is our first fear. Uh, it is our first fear as humans. Uh, since we were small children and our parents disappeared from view because they went out of sight behind the hands of peekaboo or around the wall into the next room, out the door for a day of work, driving away from daycare, we have this fear of being abandoned. And this extends to our careers, our jobs, and certainly our technology choices. What if this thing goes away? What if we are abandoned like we were with Silverlight? Silverlight isn't even Microsoft's only abandoned wear from that from that decade, light switch was abandoned, web matrix was abandoned, card space was abandoned. All of them were dropped in that same decade. Um, so was the source control platform uh, CodePlex. It came and went within the span of a decade. Uh, paired with that fear of abandonment is our fear of rejection. Um, if abandonment is based on our use of the tool and our relationship with the vendor, with the, with the creator, rejection is based on our relationship with our colleagues and our peers. Um, if the last is abandoned wear, I'm going to call this one ugly wear. Um, it's ugly wear because the technology is perfectly fine, but it is just fallen out of favor. Um, as users of ugly wear were shunned because the, the libraries, the, the frameworks, uh, the tools that we choose to pursue. Um, this rejection can be within a single developer community. Uh, it can be within the Microsoft ecosystem. Uh, certainly web forms has fallen out of favor. Uh, millions of projects still use it, even today. Millions of projects still use it. Millions of developers are still using web forms, but it's well, when was the last time you saw a session at a user group or a conference on web forms? Been a very long time. Um, this rejection can be cross community instead of within a single community, it can be cross community to the typical .NET developer, Java is ugly, Sign and Oracle are evil. To the stereotypical Java developer, .NET is ugly and Microsoft is evil. Uh, it could be over tooling. Uh, if you don't use Vim, you are a simpleton. And if you do use Vim, you're an elitist. And the third aspect of fear is uh, a fear of commitment. Now, we're afraid of the burden entailed with learning this different thing, this new thing. We're afraid that it will... Um, 
take more than we expect. It'll be more involved than we expect. It comes with more baggage than we expect. Uh, we're afraid that it'll be too much or at least too much for us. Um, the most current and relevant example is ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a technology that we know we want to invest in, but we may be hesitant because it requires learning additional technology like OpenAI. And we see this over and over again, learning Angular, uh, Angular 2 and beyond comes with the additional burden of learning TypeScript. Uh, is learning Angular worth the, the repercussion, the burden, the commitment of having to learn TypeScript? Uh, if I want to learn WordPress, is it worth the burden of familiarizing myself with PHP? Uh, maybe I'm starting to go into Node and NPM. What's that? Uh, if you're a developer in Ruby, you, sure, you need to learn all about Ruby, then you also need to learn about gems and you need to learn about bu bu uh, Bundler and then you need to learn a web framework like, I don't know, Rails or Sinatra. Learning C Sharp means learning .NET, means learning ASP.NET Core, means learning Entity Framework and NuGet. There's a lot that comes along with these choices. There's a lot that we need to commit to with these choices. And that burden of learning new stuff, new tech, um, gets worse the less you know about the thing, the less you know about its adjacent neighbors, about its dependencies, about its ecosystem. It gets worse the less you know. It's more overwhelming the less you know. And at the start when we're just looking to learn a new framework, a new language, we know nothing. And they have told me that this you know, new thing is going to be awesome, but is it really going to be awesome for me? Is it going to solve my problems? Is it going to address my needs? Um, I don't know, take it outside of tech, learning to ride a skateboard, learning to ride a skateboard looks cool. Everybody, you know, my age still wants to be Tony Hawk because Tony Hawk is my age and he's still awesome on a skateboard, but I know that I'm going to fall down a lot and I'm going to hurt myself and I'm going to scrape my knees and my elbows. Surfing looks awesome. Sure. But I'm unlikely to try surfing if I'm not already awesome at swimming or if I'm, I don't know. Scared of sharks. Or fear is that shark. Fear of abandonment, the fear of rejection, the fear of commitment, the fear that the technology is going to go away, uh, that we're all going to be left behind, that we're going to be obsolete, the fear that technology isn't going to be communal, uh, that's used unapologetically by every member of our tribe, the fear that it will be too much that it can't be contained, that it can't be handled, that I can't handle it. And we doubt ourselves. We, we doubt that we're up to the task. Um, we doubt that our effort will be accepted, that we doubt that our effort will be worthwhile. So we end up not chasing squirrels. We take notice of the squirrels, we shout squirrel. And then we go back to resuming our previous conversation. We see a new technology, we take notice, and then the fear sets in, that abandonment, that rejection, that commitment, that self-doubt. We know that the squirrels are there, but we don't actually give chase. We're afraid that we're going to choose poorly. We're afraid that we will chase the wrong squirrel, that we will go in the wrong direction. We're so afraid that we're going to screw it up, that we just do nothing. So what gets in our way is in our existing skill sets or our release timelines. It's fear, but there's a workaround. We just need to we just need to shift our perceptions. Like with Silverlight. Silverlight wasn't stronger and it wasn't simpler. It was just different. It certainly wasn't more secure. The NCF uh, common uh, vulnerabilities and exposures database lists 30 known attack vectors for Silverlight including a particular one that was the nail in the proverbial coffin in 2003 that was regarding remote code execution. Um, and really though, all of these nails in the coffin, all of these vulnerabilities, um, they weren't as much of an issue as really it's other challenges, it's other Obstacles, it's other competition. The popularity of HTML5 continued to increase, uh, making plugins like Flash and Silverlight and Shockwave and Java applets, making them all obsolete. You know, even though that, that death knell was 
Google announcing that Chrome was no longer going to support the NP API, the, the Netscape plugin API that all of them, Silverlight, Flash, and Friends were built on top of, uh, followed closely by Microsoft announcing that their brand new browser at the time, Edge, would never even support the NP API in the first place. So, sure, Silverlight seemed like a solid investment in 2007. And sure, eight years, it had entirely disappeared and people were mad. We invested eight years into this technology and Microsoft had just walked away from it, but it was a solid investment. It absolutely was a solid investment. It was around for eight years. What other libraries that you're working on eight years ago are you still using today? Think about the other libraries from the past. Popularity of Knockout JS was five years long. The popularity of Ember JS was about six. Backbone lasted five years. Angular JS, Angular One, spanned four. Silverlight was around eight from birth to abandonment. Yet people are mad after investing their time for Microsoft to walk away. But Microsoft had to. The ecosystem had moved on. The user base had moved on. The developer base had moved on. The world had moved on from Silverlight and it had to be abandoned. And that's it, that's the first key to overcoming our fear. We have to change our perception. We have to change it from a position of fear and judgment to a position of this exploration and curiosity, that abandonment. We're driven this by uh, this idea, this concept of, of abandonware, of being abandoned, driven by the, um, the love of the things we have, the things we struggle to keep going as technologists, we have, <laughs> we have a box. I do. I'm sure you do. Somewhere in your house, you have a box of old computer pieces and parts and cables and cords. Because why? Because we might need it. Right? We keep that old 1980s Nintendo Inter Entertainment System despite the fact that almost all of the games are available on emulators or on modern consoles like a Switch, Nintendo Switch. I can play the original Super Mario Brothers 3 on my Switch right now without having to repeatedly blow into some old cartridge just to make it work. But I still have my NES and I still have my Super Mario Brothers 3 cartridge. It's right in the garage. I know right where they are. And I still have my Super Nintendo. And I still have my N64. And I still have my GameCube. I still have my Game Boy Advance. I still have my PlayStation 2. I still have cartridges for Missile Command for the Atari 2600, even though I no longer still have a functional Atari 2600. I have an Intellivision. It's in the same box. We fear letting go of that old stuff. We fear letting go. But usually... That thing has gone away because it's been replaced by something better, obsolete. In these cases, is a good thing. Silverlight doesn't wasn't abandoned. It was obsolete. It was replaced by HTML5. It was replaced by a more secure browser. With it, it was replaced by better protection of our personal data and our passwords and our credit scores and our bank account balance was replaced by a system that no longer needed a Silverlight plugin, which meant that it were Flash plugin. So it no longer needed Silverlight or Flash. When our, our, our frameworks, when they become, when they become obsolete, we should just celebrate because it means we've found a brand new, a, a, a better way to accomplish a task, to complete a task, to, to solve the problem, to finish the goal. And if you haven't learned that new thing yet, great, cool. You've gained experience in other things. And if you know what it used to be like, even better, the pain of doing it the old way, you've still leveled up. So congratulations, because, well, all of these new techs and these new abandonments are new opportunities for us to level up as, as technologists. And sure, Silverlight never became that flash killer. I guess it's 
I guess it's not without an element of irony that HTML, the very thing that necessitated the need for Flash to provide rich media user experiences was also the very same thing that eliminated Flash and Silverlight's necessity. And Silverlight never became that Flash killer. We killed it. Flash and Silverlight, we killed it through our ad blockers and as developers through our pursuit of something different and as IT professionals looking for uh, improved security, all of that is how Silverlight got abandoned. The world moved on. Um, Silverlight's existence may have expedited or delayed the death of Flash. We don't know. But Silverlight certainly was there to provide competition. The other side of abandonment, it's not always due to obsolescence. Libraries and, and, and frameworks can be replaced with competition that's still solving the same problem, existing in the same medium. Um, if you've been developing, I've been developing on the web for almost 30 years now. If you've been around a while for me, uh, you might remember the old JavaScript libraries like Prototype JS and MooTools. In the beginning, the three of them were head to head to head three way battle uh, MooTools, Prototype JS, and jQuery. Obviously, we know who won. Competition won. Knockout and Backbone and AngularJS and Ember and Angular 2.0 and Vue and React. These are all certainly JavaScript-based front-end MV star style frameworks. And within this space, there are abandoned frameworks. There are branded frameworks that saw widespread use. There are abandoned frameworks that never really saw the light of day. They never saw popularity within this space. Uh, there were alternatives. There were substitutions that all accomplished the same task. Just some were easier or faster or better. Um, so when our frameworks are abandoned and freer of direct competitors, still celebrate because it means we have found a new, better way, a more efficient way to complete a task, to complete a goal, to solve a problem. And just like before, uh, you've gained experience. You know what it used to be like. You know the pain of doing it the old way. So again, congratulations. You've been presented with an opportunity to level up. Rejection. Think back for a moment, the last time you were rejected from a space because of your technology choices. Rejected. Blatantly, deliberately excluded from a space. Like Dr. Seuss's Sneechers with uh, the, the Frankenfurter parties, if you remember the old Dr. Seuss books. Like steerage separated from first class on the Titanic. Like gangs of LA versus gangs of New York. It hasn't happened. We've never been excluded like that. But yet, as Steinbeck writes in East of Eden, once a boy has suffered rejection, he will find rejection even where it does not exist. Or worse, will draw it forth from people simply by expecting it. We'll find rejection even where it doesn't exist. So we are obsessed with this inclusion, with being in the popular crowd, with being the cool kids. So we just follow the same old trends in the same old places. We don't explore, we don't investigate, we don't learn, we don't follow, we just consume, we regurgitate the same old lines from the same old places because we fear rejection even where it doesn't exist. But the truth is, we really never know how acceptance is going to turn out. Um, plenty of superior technologies have failed to take hold, like Betamax over VHS. Plenty of superior technologies were just ahead of their time, like JavaScript. It's thrown atop the mountain after spending the first half of its lifetime relegated to the junior intern web developer for making mouse overs and image rollovers. No matter what we do with the picking what will be the, the, the awesome, will never be anything more than a prediction, anything more than a, than a gamble or best guess, and that's okay. We all have our hobbies and passions that are 
that are unique to us. I collect board games. I mean, I really, really collect board games. Counting all of the base games and the expansions and even the little one-off promotional cards that you can get from conferences like, like Gen Con, I have over 600 board games. They're upstairs in the closet, but they don't all fit in the closet. So there's a cupboard across the hallway from that closet that has there's another cupboard over in the dining room that has it. There's a bookshelf in the living room that has some board games. There's another stack over in the on the floor over here. There's board games everywhere in my house. Over 600 board games. Consumes all of the cupboards, all of the closets in my house. All of the random bookshelves. And though I know countless people that play board games, I don't know anybody that collects board games like I do. So we all have our things in our life that we explore, that we pursue that are unique to us. Um, the passion of board games uh, is, is certainly part of my identity. Um, but what about the other things that I explore? Um, you know, a few years ago, I spent some time exploring Python, but that's not a part of my identity. I don't call myself a Python developer. I've read a few blog posts and I attended a few conference workshops over the year and wrote a few small apps in Electron, but Electron's not on my resume. And um, all of these things, things like that, they might at most come up in conversations in the, in the hallway or at the water cooler at happy hour. What did you think of it? And you might share your opinions of how much you dislike Python or Electron or you think uh, with board games that competing over cardboard and paper money is a stupid waste of time. But you're not going to exclude me from happy hour or the water cooler or the hallway conversation because of, you know, me and Python or me and Electron or me and board games. Um, you know, these technology choices, I'm a, I'm a big hockey guy. Uh, these technology choices are a lot like hockey fandoms. And really, they're nothing more. Um, you may you may say you love the Dallas Stars like a religion. You might despise anything to do with the Vegas Golden Knights. But if we're both hockey fans, at the end of the day, we're just going to spend hours and hours talking about hockey, and we're going to spend time discussing if Lemieux was a better player than Gretzky. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, or if Jonathan Quick is a better goalie than Cam Peterson. He is. Or if Brett Hall's skate was really in the crease 25 years ago in 99, playing the Sabres for the Stanley Cup. And of course it was, it absolutely was all day long. But it doesn't matter if you're a, a, a Stars fan and I'm a Knights fan. We're just going to spend all of this time talking about hockey, talking about our views and our opinions and our preferences and our favorites, just like, just like tech, just like technology. It doesn't matter that I like .NET and you like Java, we're still going to spend hours discussing our perspectives on code, sharing our individuality. <clears throat> and finally, that fear of commitment. Sure, Ruby's intimidating. There's no, there's no static typing like we're used to. Everything is dynamic. There's lambdas everywhere. What is this kind of magical nonsense? I mean, there's methods for if your method is missing that we can automatically fall into. And that's still kind of weird for me. And on top of it all, you can't just learn Ruby. You have to learn about gems and Bundler and Rails and Sinatra. And it's a lot. But that's assuming we approach new technology like we approach a marriage. We're committed to .NET. You shouldn't really be thinking about Ruby. That would be That would be cheating. And if I really want to learn about Ruby, then I need to break up with .NET. I remember when Ruby first became mainstream a long time ago, when it first became the popular thing. So many Microsoft-based .NET developers with their blog posts proclaiming of why I'm leaving .NET and becoming a Ruby developer. .NET is too much work and Microsoft is evil. It's too much effort to maintain these applications. Like marriage, my partner is high maintenance. My mother-in-law is evil. I can't deal with these kids. I want a divorce. 
Or should I just stay in the marriage that I have? I mean, yeah, the .NET world has its flaws, but look how much I will need to invest to be proficient at Ruby. But technology is not marriage. It's exposure, not proficiency. More like the student, not the master. No one's getting married. No one's getting married. Exploring these two new technologies is professional development, not production development. Professional development, not production development. Professional development is different than production development. There's no support contracts, no service level agreements. There's no obligations. You don't have to be committed to the thing. Did you learn a little bit? Good. Do you want to keep going and learn some more about it? Yes? Good. Keep going. You work a little bit more. How about now? Still want to keep going? Yes, good. Keep going a little bit more. How about now? No? Had enough? That's cool too. What's next? In your time learning this technology, exploring this technology, no matter, no matter how long or how brief you learn new concepts, you altered your perceptions, you honed or changed your opinions, and you became a better developer. It all happened because we changed our perceptions and through that we gave ourselves permission. Permission to be abandoned and rejected. Permission to make the wrong choice. Permission to screw it up. Permission to explore. Permission to explore and screw it up is permission to be awesome. Because in reality, we can't screw it up. In reality, we can't get it wrong. Because professional development isn't the same thing as production development. Learning is the only thing that's going to make us awesome at our craft, and yet we can't screw it up. We will get it right. We can't be abandoned. We're the ones that abandon the technology. We can't choose the wrong thing because each thing makes us better and we commit only and exactly what we want to put into it. We control all the time. We hold all the keys. We make all the choices. So as soon as we get out of our own way, the only thing left for us to do is succeed. We just have to give ourselves permission to do so. We just have to get out of our own way. We need to stop viewing success as a factor of... We need to stop viewing success as, as longevity. It's really what it comes down to. We need to start viewing the success factor as, as simply knowledge and learning. Every single framework, every library, every, every language, every um, component that you learn has a shelf life. Technology rarely survives even a decade. Most of our libraries and frameworks will survive only five to eight years, just like Silverlight. From the initial release to the abandonment. But remember that it's not the library that abandons us. We abandon the library. We walk away. We move on. We find something better. We iterate. We improve. The ancient Egyptians, they're long gone. We're still learning about their culture and their customs and their habits. We're still learning their language. Um, we're still trying to figure out how they made these big, gigantic mountain shrines out of sand in the middle of the desert. But we're learning. We're doing the process of learning. We're learning about language constructs, learning about the ancient world, learning about gigantic mountain shrines in the middle of the desert that can last 6,000 years. Ancient Egypt is long, long abandoned, but many millennia later, it's still full of lessons and still full of opportunity. It's still full of opportunities for us to level up. And stop viewing the success factor as popularity. Start viewing the success factor as simply knowledge and learning. Somebody out there is going to love the thing you are learning. It's going to be Muhammad Ali. It's the greatest. Somebody out there is going to hate the thing you're learning. Like, like how President uh, George H.W. Bush, the first one, how President Bush hates broccoli. How we all hate eating vegetables as a kid. It's a lot of religion and politics and software development. But again, professional development is different than production development. There's no experience. There's no documentation required beyond what exists inside of your own head. It's your knowledge. It's your level up. You are pursuing what helps you further your career and yours alone, not the career of others. It's your path. 
Only you can walk it. No, no. Others can walk it with you, and no, but no one can walk it for you. Just like you can take a plural sight course with somebody, but you can't take a plural sight course for somebody. So it doesn't matter what you learn. Explore the unpopular. Explore the small market. Choose small talk or Hadoop. The only thing that matters is how you apply it. And stop viewing the success factor as proficiency. That commitment. Start viewing the success factor as, as knowledge and learning, um, with many points and opportunities along the way. Um, it's like a like a scenic drive through the hills. Break down the elements of your uh, professional learning, like you would the requirements of building a production app. Your .NET developer that wants to learn Rails but knows nothing of Ruby, great. Identify the first step and start there. Get exposure to Ruby. The first step isn't even to install the language because there's dozens of great online code, school, code schools and websites, online REPLs, where you can just learn some Ruby, typing it into a box in a browser window. And if you decide that Ruby is a good thing and you decide that it's something you want to continue pursuing, go on to whatever your step two is, then make the decision again, iterate, repeat. Step three, ask again. And if at any point along the way you say it's not worth it, Walk away, good job. You still gained experience. You leveled up from I hate Ruby to I hate Ruby because. And if you continue with the thing, there's still no worry. Learning about the thing doesn't commit you to a, a dedicated life with the thing. If that was the case, we would all still be dissecting frogs because once in the science class back in seventh grade, we learned about dissecting frogs and that automatically committed us to it. No. But still back then you learned about frogs and because you learned a little bit about frogs, you learned a little bit about basic anatomy and that has influenced how you view your own body. Likewise, learning a little bit about Ruby is not just taught you about Ruby, but about language constructs and other languages and how to learn other languages. And all of that influences how you view C Sharp or Python or JavaScript. Because, you know, learning one language, even just the bas basics, makes it easier to learn other languages. Learning the basic fundamentals of Spanish makes it easier to learn Italian and French, Portuguese, and learning the Basics of German will make it easier for you to learn Austrian or Dutch or Icelandic. Learning fosters learning. Learning, it's like exercising a muscle. You know, when we learned our multiplication tables as a small child, we were really, really learning about learning and learning about processes and learning about systems and learning about systematic approaches. So did you level up to I hate Ruby because? Well, great. Good job when i watched it a couple years ago ted lasso i loved the scene towards the end of the very first season ted lasso is he's playing darts on a bet with the villain of the series and he says a little monologue, which I think was great. It goes, you know, guys have underestimated me my entire life. And for years, I never understood why. It used to really bother me. But then one day I was driving my little boy to school and I saw this quote by Walt Whitman, Whitman painted on the wall. And it said, be curious, not judgmental. I like that. So I got back into my car, I'm driving to work and all of a sudden it hits me. All those fellas that used to belittle me, not a single one of them were curious. They thought they had everything figured out, so they judged everything and they judged everyone. And I realized that they're underestimating me, who I was, had nothing to do with it. Because if they were curious, they would ask questions. So how do you know what to pursue and how do you know which language to invest in and how do you know which frameworks to ignore? Just be curious, not judgmental. Do you feel like you are chasing squirrels sometime with these technology choices? Good, because as long as you are chasing squirrels and not just noting them and saying squirrel and then returning to the previous conversation, you're improving. We don't know 
the answer going into this learning uh, endeavor? We don't know. Uh, learning is about asking questions. That's why it's learning. We don't know if this is going to be a viable solution for us in, as individuals. We don't know if this is going to be beneficial to us as technologists, but that's what we're here to find out. Iterating in our learning process, taking a small step, reevaluating and repeating, casting a very wide net, because yes, there are a lot of technologies out there that make up our craft. Good. It means that there's a lot of squirrels out there for us to chase. There's a lot of opportunities. Pick one and chase it for a moment and then pick a different one and chase that one for a moment and then pick a different squirrel and chase that one for a moment, casting that very wide net and figuring out which squirrel catches your eye, which new framework or technology or plugin piques your interest. You can be interested in the very first squirrel and still chase other squirrels because you know this isn't dating. Your first love interest might not respond too well to you dating others for a little bit, but a squirrel isn't going to care. You know, that yard is full of, I don't know, compersive polyamorous squirrels and Ruby's not going to get upset that she went and explored a relationship with Python for a minute. And after you've chased a few squirrels, come back to one of the earlier squirrels that you enjoyed chasing. Maybe you liked how fast it ran or... Maybe you liked how it zigzagged across the lawn or how it ran in circles around the tree. The reason doesn't matter. It's your reason as long as you enjoy chasing that squirrel and go chase it a little further this time. And if someone else is already chasing that squirrel, that's fine too. You can help each other out by going fox hunting. One hound never said to the other hound to stay away. This is my fox. Go find your own fox to hunt. No, it's all, yay, my friends are here. We're going to go after this fox together. Let's get him. What do we do when we catch him? I don't know. No one ever told us that part. I don't know. Maybe we'll just all be friends and lick his face. Learning software is the exact same way. And if you decide that that, that that squirrel, that technology is no longer worthwhile or viable to you, walk away from it and pursue something else. But you can walk away knowing that you have learned about this thing. No matter how much or how little you've already leveled up, your knowledge of this thing sticks with you and it will aid you as you pursue the other libraries and the other technologies, even when they seem completely unrelated. Well, me as a, as a web developer, as a primarily Microsoft-based web developer with negligible Ruby experience, my success factor is not proficiency in Rails. My success factor is learning a little bit about Ruby so that I can be a better Microsoft web developer. And I am a better web developer because I know some Ruby. Again, what I learned about language constructs and Lambda expressions and how to organize my code and how to handle dynamic properties. I'm a better web developer because of my knowledge of Flash. Flash paid a lot of my bills a long time ago. Flash helped me have a better understanding of vector-based vector -based graphics and animations and keyframes. Uh, it helped me have a better understanding of guiding the user onward and, and, and forward in their workflow. Flash helped me grasp how animations can help provide guidance to the user and guide their eye. Flash is action script. It's, you know, it's still ECMAScript. So everything I learned about ActionScript directly helped me with JavaScript too. Knowing Flash has made me a made me a certainly a better web developer, even though I haven't touched Flash in over 15 years. Um, you know, and I'm a better HTML developer because I know CSS and knowing how the browser parses out CSS against the DOM. I'm a better Angular developer because I know Backbone and many of the concepts that I learned in my few short years as a backbone developer influenced my angular code and uh, including the backbone concepts of what not to do i haven't touched a backbone in almost 10 years but backbone still makes me a better angular developer but i'm also a better web developer because i don't know ember and because i don't know meteor js because i don't know react i don't know Vue. Of course, that in no way says that those frameworks are, are bad or that they're not worth pursuing. I'm sure that I would be a web developer if I did know that. But in this case, I'm a better web developer because I consciously and deliberately pursued what was valuable to me, what piqued my interest, what I found exciting.
regardless of the commitment or the longevity or the popularity. We still have a rough idea of what those frameworks do and how they work and read a few blog posts. I made it through the step one. I'm a better web developer because I read those posts on Ember and Meteor and React and Vue and call it because I'm a better web developer because I chase squirrels. I have a rough idea of what they do. And if the opportunity ever comes along, if something changes that influences my worldview and, and their viability to me, then I may pursue them someday, iteratively. The step, repeat, reevaluate, repeat. And so long as that new framework, that new tech, that new plugin, that new whatever is valuable to me. But these languages, of course, and these frameworks are not my professional identity. Yes, I do pursue web technologies deeply. I also know how to, I don't know, rebuild a combustion engine. I know how to dissect a frog, kind of. But still, I choose to develop to identify as a web developer and not as a mechanic and not a biologist. I'm because I identified by the subset of technologies that I choose to identify with, the subset of anything, any knowledge that I choose to identif identify with, not the superset of all of the technologies I have explored. I choose. I, I choose the identify. I, I choose the squirrels that I choose to identify with, the squirrels that I choose to chase. And of course, I chase a lot of squirrels. We all do. We all should. But in every step, every step doesn't matter what I pursue. I level up. Every, every bit of new knowledge that I learned shapes that worldview and it can be applied everywhere else with every every step I'm uh, I'm stronger I'm stronger and fitter and more productive doesn't matter if it's a deep dive into angular or just a blog post on react with every step I get better like, like exercise learning and languages and learning libraries and learning frameworks are are, are, are exercise exercise like like chasing a squirrel so which technology should I look into? Which technology should I pursue? Which technologies are gonna be most beneficial to my career and to my business? Well, the truth is it doesn't matter. Um, Cause they all will. All of them will be beneficial to you. All, any of them will be beneficial to you. What matters is that you continue to learn consciously and deliberately and authentically. Uh, what matters is that you are curious, not judgmental. Learn that thing, whatever it is. Um, pursue the thing, whatever it is. And through that exercise, you will absolutely level up. So which one to choose? It doesn't matter. As long as you, the the developer puppy, you get up from, I don't know, you get up from your water bowl, you put down your favorite squeaky toy and spend a moment, just just a moment getting out there and chasing squirrels. Thank you. Jay, that was so awesome. That was greatly appreciated. There in the chat was uh, definitely admiring the amount of board games that you have and how there's lack of room for the museum of parts that you also have. And we were also many comments about what um, basically dinosaur age type of uh, hardware we have at our houses as well so we 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 combined could make one heck of a of a museum so, right um i'll tell you something that i really appreciated is professional code versus production code when you're learning something it's to add to your profession it doesn't mean you have to go to production with it and i, I just love that shift that 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 difference in mindset that it you can change the way that you're attacking why you're learning this code right and yes. I, and i think that in, in if i i suspect that if more people will do that they're going to explore more and they're going to play more and they're going to learn more and and i love that and um and some of the also comment, the comments about what books that we have on our bookshelves and things like that. There's so much foundational knowledge that we have had just over our past lives that that have built us to you know who we are today and are getting us going moving forward. I, I've done a little bit with networking and VLANs things like that. 
and it has helped me tons to work with Azure networking, you know, and, sure. and exploring that direction, right? And so it's amazing what we can pick up, even if it's yesterday's tech or uh, language, we can learn so much from that. So I, I really like that. There were some really good comments in, in the chat about this talk as well. So thank you very much for doing that. I really appreciate that. I'm going to open it up right quick. If you guys have any questions, you're more than welcome to come off of mute and ask. Or if you would prefer to wait till the recording is over, you're welcome to do that as well. So we'll, we'll give that a second. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say very inspirational and very very interesting. So thank you very, very much, Jay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Darren's. Yeah, what I if think you're, I one up the uh, I think I one up the book. <laughs> oh nice. <laughs> this is nice. like the original. <laughs> you're gonna make me cry. I know, but it's so well written too. <laughs> it's just <laughs> disgustingly good. <laughs> Oh, but one of the, uh, seriously. so much you're right Sean so much that learned out of this and just even good documentation <laughs> yeah yeah Joshua what were you saying the old, the uh, old stuff, just, that great talk. stuff absolutely oh. is is beneficial one of the things like uh, um well we were talking about video games we were talking about those old NES consoles or you know missile command for an Atari uh learning and understanding even those old video games because uh there's the sure now if if we want to go download a 10 gigabyte video game that's full of cutscenes and you know high definition and whatever else we can do that but there's also something to be said for learning those older video games like you know pac-man and missile command where you had to fit a whole lot of gameplay ongoing replayability in you know 600k of code or less so uh, there was a lot of there's a lot to be learned from uh, those old lessons and those old limitations. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and it kind of brings up why Minecraft, right? It has simplistic graphics, and yet it spread like wildfire. And then Microsoft bought it, yeah, mm -hmm. and and uh, persisted that game. So I mean, that's that's a great one where you don't even have to have all the high def uh images and stuff and right. still bring it back um joshua what were you saying i was just gonna thank you jay for the the great talk it was um actually very very inspirational and also i think it's kind of the theme of the whole talk so i'm not you know blowing anybody's mind here but for me the the biggest takeaway is just allowing yourself to explore without feeling like you're wasting your time um I think that's that's a huge point that a lot of people, including myself, when you know starting out, you feel like you need to learn the thing that's going to get you the job or learn the thing that you know you can make your career with, but you don't know enough to know enough to know what you need to learn. So <clears throat> allowing yourself to explore is uh, it, it was just great. It was a very very good talk. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything. I, I, I'm very adamant that uh, anything that we learn in our technology space is going to help us in our technology space. I've never written an app in, you know, I, I keep going back to Ruby. I've never written an app in Ruby, yet at the same time, the knowledge that I do have in Ruby all directly applied to my skill inside of C Sharp because Ruby helped me be better at Lambda expressions and dynamics, just as a baseline example. A lot of that stuff all, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, we talk about cross-pollination inside of the technology space, but I think often we underestimate just how much cross-pollination there is. So many of our fundamental libraries and, and concepts are, are universal across all of the different languages and platforms. Uh, and we're just stealing from each other all the time. Yeah, and that's a good yeah I love that. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I wish I could get this message across to some of my colleagues. Yes. And sometimes 
you know, we, we got to be the example and not the, not the preacher kind of thing. Right. And, um, and sometimes, sometimes we're the ones that excel and those that want to hold on to doing nothing are the ones that are left behind. It's their choice. So, but I don't know, send them this video, see if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? You're more than welcome to come off and mute and ask, or you're welcome to put them in chat and I will uh, ask on your behalf, or you're more than welcome to wait until after the recording has stopped. <laughs>